We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hi everyone, my name is Juan pa Juan. My name is Omo Pajaro Velasquez. Um, but all the queer in IA organization is an organization based in the United States that works for advocacy to the to more inclusion of queer scientists in topics related with artificial intelligence. I'm from Colombia. Uh, my background is uh, communication studies, cultural study, and soon I'm going to start a master in, in ethics and society. That is my main topic of, that I'm trying right now. Here in, the, in this slide, there is a couple of things about me, so to know who you know who I am. I'm a non-binary person, so I go with the they then pronounce, and in Spanish, ella and le. Um, as in every Korean event, we have certain codes code of conduct that we like people to follow because we like the people, everyone feel, must be feel safe in these spaces. So please, if you follow these rules, uh, I think you will be feel safe here. Or please stick to that, please. <laughs> so something about Queer in IA is a volunteer -run organization until now. It's part of STINE, that is an organization that works for, advoc for advocacy, uh, in, in including queer scientists and queer people in, in, a science, uh, in STEAM careers. It's based in the United States. Uh, Queer and IA started during NEURIS, that is a conference that occurs every year that is about the neurological uh, networks in related with artificial intelligence. It was starting in 2017 at the Resolora Amirot. And we realized in that moment that we need more representation and open more space for queer people in this field. Uh, our mission is to raise awareness of queer issues in artificial intelligence and machine learning, foster a community of queer researchers, and celebrate the work of queer and trans scientists. What we're doing right now is very much work, workshops and social uh, most AI, uh, machine learning, and neurolinguistic process conference. Uh, um, this is the first known related AI conference that we are. So it's like, like the next, or next goal to be participating more in non-related AI conference because we think that we can reach more people in that way and may know what we are doing right now. We all file for investigation that are, we are developing in this moment. Um, but, uh, one of the investigations is the result of this, uh, of, of, oh, it isn't changed there. Well, is it the result of the demographic survey? The demographic survey is, uh, it was made to identify and uh, identify queer communities and change the future of the programs that we're going to develop in the query in NIA. And we, uh, uh, we found that 30% of non cis or non cis fall, cis refer to gender identified correspond with the sex assigned by birth. Uh, 20.5% of the people are black or people of color. 10% are mentioned that they have disability. 5% they say they are graduate student and 20% uh share their names. I don't know what is not sharing. Okay. 
Uh, after that, we came and realized that also most of the people, about 80% of the people that respond or demographic study says that they don't have any representation in the in the in the in the um, in the laboral uh, uh, fields or in the scientist fields or in academic fields now i'm going to explain exactly what I, what we going what we are going to share what you, what i wanted to share today the is one of the other investigation that we call the uh, ai versus or bodies this project came out from from the question that is uh, from the pandemic times when we realized that some queer folks were uh, seeing that their posts on social media were blocked so we start a question about content moderation tools and how these content moderation tools affect uh, queer people and why this content moderation tool affect queer people and women. So uh, during our, our first test of investigation, we see that this platform pretty much doesn't have many regulations when it comes to content moderation tools. So we start to ask if, if they don't have so many regulations, but also for who they are regulating. And that's when we realize that they actually these social media platforms are not regulating for women and gender diverse people. They are mainly, they're mainly regulating for male, white, cis persons, the, the only regulating for them. So this is excluding gender diversity and women. From that moment, we started to think what we can do about it. What we can, what we had to do to change, to change that. So in like two months of conversation and, and trying to find what we at uh, exactly can we do, we came out the uh, probably a new epistemology that combines uh, social science with some technical backgrounds can be something that could face all the bias that, that are towards uh, gender diverse people and women in in the development of the artificial intelligence. So we said like a, a set or couple of steps of how to achieve this epistemology. Uh, the epistemology is, we said like the, first, the most important thing is to gain trust in this artificial intelligence because we need to trust that is the bias is going to be le the less as possible. So we go, we verify, we, we, we decide that verification, monitor, monitoring, and advocacy are the three main points to gain trust that they are uh, to gain trust and, uh, on this kind of technologies, especially when we are, are going to talk with, uh, about gender diversity and women. Uh, also, we came up with the participatory design, uh, not only include here in the, the in the design part, uh, technicals, also include social scientists, and especially people that are, are identified themselves as gender diverse and, and trans and women because it's totally necessary that from the, the design stage, we start to think how these artificial intelligence are going to look. The third uh, point that we think about is was most like a, a gender approach that we say that like the more theoretical part of, the, of, this, of this kind of solution or quitting the IA that we call it. So we try to think and we realize that pretty much 
the way that we know the world is based in a science that is produced, um, made and developed by men. And so uh, everything, everything that is hard is understanding a science and everything that is soft is not understanding a science and, and also is compared to female. So we learn, learning out from the development of the different artificial intelligence, the soft part that also should be included in this kind of, of, of technologies. And that is when we, let's say in a really risky way, decide to collect a queer epistemology for artificial intelligence. And we envision this queer epistemology for artificial intelligence like a trans theoretical analysis where we uh, combine uh, the colonized theories, queer theories, uh, machine, learning, machine learning theories, and uh, uh, yeah, neuro linguistic processing. We, between those four things, we decide that could be uh, the way to resolve some bias towards uh, uh, gender diverse and, and women. Also, within the transsectoral communication, that means not only the people that are technical to be the ones that are doing these things, also social scientists must be part of this process and should communicate with the technical part what, how this technology should be developed because the, uh, the, this technology has impact in the real life. We have to admit that. And people is affected by that. We see it every day, especially right now with the, with the face recognition, especially for trans people. Uh, there is some cases or some examples pretty much everywhere in the world. In India, for example, during the pandemic, uh, some trans person couldn't access to, to, to health, to healthcare because the software or the recognition, the recognition face software actually identify it as the opposite says that it says in the in their ID card. So that is a problem that we need to face. So we think also that the three uh, besides constructing trust with verification, monitoring, monitoring, and advocacy, we need to think this from the design stage, development stage, and implementation stage. We need to be doing this all the time because bias are always going to appear. If we want to achieve a better technology, we need to be constantly monitoring and constantly addressing those bias. And finally, uh, this is more related to artificial intelligence governance. We've seen the, the model of multi stakeholderism. Uh, could be a really good solution to address uh, the, the problems of having bias towards gender diverse people and women. And that was pretty much it, the lighting tool. If, if you have any question about it or want, may want to make some comment, well, I'm here to hear all of you. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is uh, Veronica. Um, I'm part of the uh, you know, youth uh, initiatives here in Katowice. And um, first I want to thank um, Kwan for this uh, initiative and also for this lighting talk and also for the boldness. They are both uh, here. And my question and also my comment uh, that involve also a question is, since also in the European Union, we use this 
new kind of met methods like privacy by design and um, I don't know, um, um, human-centric AI. Uh, could we also talk about inclusiveness by design in this case? Yeah, also this is one of the points that actually we try to include in our, in our in the working that we are developing because this is our in developing, this is like the first results of it. So we actually is included in, and we include in that part because it's important. In, in when we mentioned in the part the design part and the development part, I actually uh, the main objective is that inclusiveness by design. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, my name is Karolina, I'm Polish. And my question is, as I understood, uh, you are a nonprofit organization. So that uh, are there any data scientists or uh, developer of the IA in your organization so that you could also develop the tool that you could be satisfied and in case you find some system that it's uh, totally disappointed for your values, you could uh, compare with something that you develop and show, for example, in case of the uh, some disagreement that there is some solution that you could accept and that's better, or I mean better, or at least some uh, other way of solving such uh, confusions that could arise and anyway, they will uh, arise at some point. Yes. Uh, dance that you mentioned that we actually develop uh, right now also a, we are actually developing like a tool for name changing with the the quotation systems because when you are trans and you change your name uh, it's really hard that uh, some scholars in this actually change your name really fast so we are trying uh, we are conducting right now like an experiment to know how fast this scholar a scholar in this change your name when you say when you make a petition to change your name to them so we are developing that tool right now so it's one of the solutions that we are making okay Hi there, it's uh, Michael, New Science Technology Agency, London. Um, quick question on what you mentioned. Would you then consider that from the policymakers' point of view, would that be beneficial to introduce to pretty much all AI-related products um, a system that could continuously uh, update the, well, obviously the machine learning on the on the on the face recognition as a whole, and that would solve the problem, hopefully for everybody. Mm. That's, a, that's a really hard uh, approach because I don't see, for, for, if you ask me, I don't see the uh, facial recognition is a technology that we should use because there's always going to, to have bias towards gender diverse people. Okay. Even we, can Im embed the data to them, there's always going to be bias. Okay, but the question is because at the moment, in the current state of the pandemic, where we are at the moment, right? We're yeah. trying to get away from being approached and have to touch something, you know, with a, with a papillary or whatever. So we're trying to do and use the face recognition I know. As, a, as a very efficient, in general, a very efficient method. But what what from point of view you consider uh, as an NGO, you could, you could, you could come with um, to, to take and tell the policymakers, what would you expect them to implement as, as the AI strategy for the country to actually include? So is it a continuous learning that you use, I don't know, every now and then your phone to take a snapshot of yours, it's uploaded. Maybe, you know, I'm, 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 coming, I'm, I'm, I'm talking very broadly here, but where we are at the moment, from my understanding in the EI universe, is really that we are designing 
the policies for the countries. Yeah. So this is the time when you want to say about trying to avoid the transgender, you know, inequality by trying to make the policymakers actually implement a system in place for them to be able to update your legal documents or your legal records by using the technology that is at the same time supporting um, the uh, the reduction in the pandemic spread. It's just basically that what I'm what I'm trying to say. So maybe the outcome from this should be that you know maybe there should be a document that will try to help them to understand what the issue is and how to make sure that even if people get older and older, you know, you need to update your documents anyway. So you know, obviously, my grandma looks now different than she used to look. 40 years ago since she had last time her picture taken so I'm, I'm just i'm just coming from this point of view you know from this standpoint yeah well uh, i had to admit we didn't think in the policy or the policy making point right now but i think it's a good idea to start thinking about it so i would take the tradition and surely i'm going to share it with my colleagues Sure. Because it's, it's really important to think in that way, as you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Because we are right now like diagnosing what we is going on, but we aren't pointing to the policies. So yeah, thank you for that. No, you're very welcome. As I said, I'm, I'm engaged in, in designing the, the policy for Poland now. And I worked over the policy in the UK. So it's, it's a crucial thing. Yeah. And I think it was overlooked in the UK. So we here in Poland are the stage where we can actually put that in place ahead of time. And you know, China's got their policy, Russia's got their policies, but obviously you can you can make that happen ahead of time. Yeah, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Uh, hello, my name is Emilia. I am here uh, as the part of the Project Youth Summit. And uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I think that there was a lot of very, very interesting and sometimes eye-opening points made. So uh, I would like to ask you because uh, recently uh, one person told me about the situation because when you are born here in Poland, you got the puzzle number, it is assigned to you. And one number in this number indicates uh, the gender uh, that was assigned to you when you were born. So this person uh, came uh, to the situation, they had to indicate their name and the special number. And the form said that their name doesn't uh, suit this special number because uh, basing on this special, this person should be female and their name is not female. So I just wanted to ask you, what would be your advice on how to react in such situations? Because, you know, this person couldn't fill this form because it just said that their name doesn't fit their puzzles, just like there's a problem. Yes, that's something personal. That is something close to my personal experience. I, I lived uh, a couple of times, <laughs> so... Uh, I think that is a regulatory problem, mainly, that is not taking in account what, the, what are the needs of the people. I think they actually, they had to take in account that people change their names and probably assume that people, that names doesn't have gender also could be a solution. But I don't know how the Polish government is willing to do that. Yeah, it's also something that is had to be with the government and the will or take that as a solution. But for the person, it's hard because it's like it's quite shocking that actually you can fill a form. Uh, actually, happened a couple of times that because I'm non binary and only had to my male and female, and male and female doesn't represent me. So I had to like. What I, what I should do with this form. So, yeah. So I think not only people also saw in private sectors should be aware of these realities, no, and not may and avoid start making feel that way because they, they had to be ahead of times. We are in 2021. It's, it's like that. Thank you. 
Yeah, I agree. I also think that maybe when it is more difficult on the governmental level, at the private companies level, it should be something totally normal, like they don't have to follow some rules that, you know, they don't have to divide names uh, to be female or male. It's just something I was just wondering, like, how we could advocate, how we could persuade these two companies, like, that they don't have to do that. Okay, uh, I see there's also other questions. So I'll oh, you over. want to say something related to that or want to comment a lot? <laughs> Uh, well, you have to have a really good pitch. I had to show really good example of how this affecting people. And actually, for me, it, for us, it really works pretty well to show examples on real life of how this issue is affecting people and how this is uh, important and, uh, and how address that is something that it gives value to the company. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Auke. Uh, I'm working at KPMG as consultant AI and trust analytics. And um, I was actually also triggered by the previous uh, question um, on how we can, for example, on how to maybe remove gender. Uh, in the Netherlands, Dutch ID cards in five, within now in five years time will have no gender uh, on the ID card anymore because in some cases it's just irrelevant. Um, and I think um, more countries and companies should follow the example of really having a close look what information should we collect what information should we process and also implement into those uh, AI models? And in you know, do we need uh, gender in our training data? That should be a question. Um, because for, for some, and actually quite a lot of purposes, you don't need that. Um, so I hope um, other countries and companies are following example uh, and try to, uh, yeah prevent this bias. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a question on the on online. Aileen, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Pajaro. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, I think your research about AI is very interesting. And I agree that software implemented during the pandemic related to health affected deeply human rights, especially for gender diverse people. And adding to Veronica's comments, uh, it's important that we should uh, have um, um, draft and, and think about um, these different policies from the beginning to be human centric. Um, so in this way, we consider from the very beginning uh, the gender diverse people and not as a last minute fix when policymakers discover that they are affecting these communities. And uh, yeah, finally, I would also like to thank you for bringing this important conversation to Poland and the ITF 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, one next go and really fast because we only have one minute. <laughs> okay, hello. Uh, thank you, Juan, for your presentation. Uh, I, my name is Ron. I am... Uh, cybersecurity analyst. So I understand that AI is a tool to extract data patterns. And you said that when doing facial recognition, the bias, uh, it, is, it makes these the trends uh, readings very, very inaccurate. And so I think this is a, a a pattern of the technology because the the borderline case is that the the AI is is built to find patterns and if you and in the cases that the patterns are not so clear to the technology it will be wrong so I think this actually happened in a lot of other uh, applications of AI, so how can you 
choose like what wait ai to these kind of situations doesn't matter like how to distinguish between the things that can be you can use ai and the things that cannot i told you you had to ask to the people that is affected by ais okay That's, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the main idea is that i am asking to you yeah yeah, I, I think in, but what we are doing like well, our investigation shows that actually most of the people that is uh, affected by AI are trans people. So I think that um, we have to include them more in all the stages of developing these technologies. If we are, if we have more uh, trans scientists behind or developing AIs, probably we have less bias. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That is will be one of one of the many answers that you could have with that. So yeah, they, they probably will address better uh how to embed this kind of data not to be that so biased to, towards them. And also read some trans theories. They also also the hell a lot. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I think we finish here. Thank you very much for being online and on site in this lighting tour.